Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, you're probably catching the last little bit of our uh, of our discussion. I know there's a little bit of latency on this for, with the live stream, but welcome to um, the the first micro seminar. Well, the first micro seminar since the quarantines have all started. Um, we're we're really happy to have uh, Roland Hudson Pickler with us today. But before I introduce him, I want to just uh, say a word of thanks to all those out there on the front lines that are uh, that are fighting with this disease. For those of you who are affected personally, um, our hearts go out to you. And um, we know this is a really tough time. And so hopefully, you know, these seminars can be a break from your from from your routine and from, you know, the tedium for those of you who who, who are, are simply bored at home. And for those of you who are actually fighting with this with this horrible situation. Um, uh, we hope that you know if, if you are actually getting to see this, that uh, that this can provide you some respite. So um, with that, let's move on to cheerier cheerier topics. Um, uh, like I said, it's my uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Roland Hudson Pickler, who's a assistant professor at the at Montana State University. Um, he did his uh, undergraduate and graduate research at the University of Vienna, and his PhD was in microbial ecology with Mickey Wagner. Um, he went on to do a postdoc with Victoria Orphan at Caltech, and uh, and then moved on to his own his own shop. And so, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to to Roland. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Cameron. Um, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, following up on uh, a shout out from Chen Biddle, uh, who said that it's obligatory these days to present your pet during live streams. Uh, so this is Mipo. I'm just going to give her a treat and then she will say bye. All right. All right. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. So first of all, I want to thank Cameron, Dave, Lissy for inviting me um, to give this micro seminar. Thanks a lot to Ismi for, for, for supporting this and broadening the scope of this fantastic online seminar series. Um, and to all of you who are joining. Um, and I hope you and your family are safe at home. All right. All right. Cameron, can you just give me the okay that this is working? Yep, looks great. Okay, awesome. Okay. <clears throat> um, so I know I'm preaching to the choir when I say that um, life on a planet is numerically dominated by microorganisms that have yet resisted cultivation and that together these enigmatic cells dominate every ecosystem on our planet, be it from the human gastrointestinal tract or the deepest trenches of our oceans. And so the only reason we know that these microorganisms um, out, uh, out there in the first place is that within the last two decades or so, the rise of massive parallel gene sequencing technologies has really opened up exciting new ways, um, exciting new views into this really mysterious world. But there's a problem with that, and that is that the ability to rapidly and easily obtain vast amounts of sequence data comes with a steep price. And that is that in these days, <clears throat> genomic studies are producing such an overwhelming large collection of hypotheses that these hypotheses are very rarely pursued to the level of empirical testing. Um, and this is a big problem because currently genome analysis um, cannot reliably predict physiology, at least not genome analysis alone. There is a lot of metadata that is needed in order to predict what the potential phenotype of a cell is in the environment. Um, and I want to you know, give a simple example that I also use for my undergraduate classes to um, you know, convey this problem. So if I look at the human genome um, and I would you know, predict which metabolism, which physiology the human organism would have without any actually have a seen a human being, I would predict that uh, the human organism is capable of seamlessly switching from aerobic respiration using molecular oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor and fermentation. And we all know that this is wrong. Humans are not yeast. But given the correct environmental condition, so to speak, for example, when you're exercising a lot, your muscles run out of oxygen supply from the blood, some parts of your body, the muscle tissues, are indeed switching to a fermentative, fermentative um, lifestyle, at least for a short amount of time. So the point is, genome analysis have intrinsic value. It is very important to do this kind of analysis, but they are limited. We need additional information. We need experimental tests to see under which conditions these genetic potential expre actually expressed on a protein level and then lead to a change in the overall cell physiology. 
And so one large part for the lack of following up with experimental test of these hypotheses is that many currently available technologies are simply not up to the test. They were designed at a day and age where something like massive genome sequencing technology was not around. The number of hypotheses was very limited and individual labs could follow up on these hypotheses one at a time in a very you know, simple, very precise manner. And this is simply not possible today because there's just too many hypotheses out there and technologies are not up to the test. So what we need is a new way of approaching this in a way that is equally critical, but in the same time, much higher throughput. And so one way we, my lab has been trying to do this is by developing um, new techniques that supplement um, other technologies that are already out there for the last decade or so that we together call next generation physiology approaches. So these are any kind of techniques that enable uh, the non-destructive analysis of cells, <clears throat> the non-destructive analysis of cells um, to interrogate the physiology, the phenotype of a cell under, if possible, in vivo in situ conditions. So to take out cells from a microbiome, analyze the phenotype, observe that phenotype, whatever that phenotype might be, non-destructively um, analyze it, separate the cell, and then follow up with additional downstream um, analysis. So for example, taxonomic identification of the cell, genomic analysis to link the genotype with the originally expressed phenotype, trying to culture the organism now with the new information of what the phenotype of that cell is, or to follow up with other, for example, high resolution microscopy techniques. So overall, we refer to these techniques as next generation physiology approaches because they are intrinsically high throughput and they pro indeed provide a new way of looking at cell physiology under as close as possible in situ conditions. Today, I will only focus on one of these approaches that is called substrate analog probing. Um, I want to point out, however, that my uh, lab is following up on additional approaches, for example, by combining um, stable isotope labeling and Raman microspectroscopy probing that provide an equal view into the um, assimilatory processes, the assimilatory physiologies that are out there. Today, we want to focus on an indirect approach that we call substrate analog probing. So the idea behind um, substrate analog probing is actually very simple. It makes use of the fact that there are synthetic compounds available that can exploit the uh, substrate promiscuity of specific enzymes in the cell. In the cases that I want to focus on today, these are um, enzymes that are involved in synthesizing biopolymers, DNA, RNA, the biological membrane, proteins, peptidoglycan, and so on, directly from uh, its monomers. So from nucleosides and nucleotides, from amino acids, individual fatty acids, or D-amino acids in the case of peptidoglycan. Um, and so the idea is that you have synthetic compounds, those are the ones in blue here, that are mimics of their natural counterparts. So for example, EDU is a nucleoside that is a, an analog that would, you can make in the lab or just order online that would replace their natural homolog, thymidine in this particular case, um, and will incorporate itself into DNA when it's being replicated. While my lab is following up on all these different kinds of labeling approaches to achieve the in vivo or in situ labeling of you know, peptidoglycan synthesizing cells, DNA, RNA synthesizing cells, me membrane lipid uh, synthesizing cells. Today, I wanna focus mainly on an approach that has been um, developed, um, has been around for the longest, for about a decade now, that is called uh, biorthogonal non-canonical amino acid tagging. So this is this idea that you take synthetic amino acids. In our case, this is these days, most of the time, it's a compound called homopropagylglycine or HPG that competes with the methionine inside of the cell. So if the compound, <clears throat> if this compound is added, excuse me. <clears throat> if this compound is added to a sample and it reaches the inside of the cell, the uptake mechanism is still not really known today. Um, it will compete to a certain extent um, with methionine, the intracellular pool of methionine inside of the cell, and then will render newly made proteins chemically different from the old protein pool. This is possible because HPG competes with methionine 
um, in the activity of the methionine tRNA synthetase, so the enzyme that um, catalyzes the esterification of methionine with its cognant um, tRNA. And so to a certain extent, HPG will be loaded into the newly made protein um, instead of methionine. The fact that the homoprobial glycine carries um, a functional site group, specifically an alkyne group, makes it possible to then use acid alkyne click chemistry, specifically copper catalyzed acid alkyne click chemistry, to tag these newly made proteins and thus the cells that contain those newly made proteins fluorescently labeled. And here's an example how this looks like on a you know, bulk cell extract level, on a single cell level, and on the actual protein level. You render all the newly made proteins and the cells that have been undergoing this protein synthesis fluorescently labeled. So one of the questions we very often get is to what extent does the addition of these synthetic amino acids actually change the physiology of the cell? Because it will change it, it's clear, because we are simply, you know, we are adding a 21st amino acid that is not occurring under, under normal conditions. Um, in the past few years, there have been just two or three studies that have tried to follow up on that. And typically what these studies achieved was to show that in HeLa cells, so in human cancer cell lines, as well as E. coli cells, um, on a proteome level, there was only very small to near negligible changes in the overall proteome. So either the expression of specific proteins or the degradation of proteins if those cells are exposed to these synthetic amino acids. We wanted to follow up on that using a complementary view into the physiology of the cell. And that is we did a metabolomic analysis of E. coli cultures that were grown either uh, just on glucose and ammonium uh, as a nitrogen source, or in which we added either methionine, AHA or HPG. So these two synthetic amino acids that we mainly use in the lab. Um, after they have been grown for a few minutes to a few hours, which corresponds to up to one generation time um, under these growth conditions, we harvested the cells, we broke them open, we extracted the intracellular metabolites and then analyzed these metabolites um, by both uh, liquid chromatography tandem mass spec, as well as one-dimensional proton NMR. Um, and all of this was done in five replicates per condition. And then we tried to analyze uh, the metabolic profile of these cells, if grown under these different conditions, and tried to see to what extent does the addition of these synthetic compounds change the biochemistry of the cell. So this study was done with my uh, great colleagues at Montana State, Valerie Kopia and Brian Bothner, who are NMR and mass spec experts respectively. Um, and the main part of this study was done by uh, Brian Bothner's graduate student, Katie Stewart, who is also the first author of this paper that we just uh, about a month ago published in Frontiers in Microbiology. I don't have the time to go over all of the results. I just wanna highlight the results that are for our discussion, the most important ones. So in mass spec, we saw about 6,000 different mass features or MOSC features. And we saw that about 7% of them were differently regulated if we added methionine, so the, the, the normal amino acid, um, to the culture as compared to the control to which no amino acid was added. If we added either AHA or HPG, so our synthetic compounds, um, an additional 8% or so of the mass features were differently regulated. So either changed in abundance or completely appeared or disappeared as compared to a control. In NMR, where we could specifically identify 55 features, we saw that about 12 of them were differently regulated. And interestingly, for the most part, the down, it was mostly a down regulation rather than up regulation of those specific metabolites. We're still trying to understand why that is exactly the case. So the overall um, result from this study was that while the global metabolome, so the 6,000 or so features we observed were only minimally affected, some specific metabolites did indeed change quite a bit. Um, and some of them we were actually able to identify using NMR. The other notion was that AHA, which is an A-site containing synthetic amino acid, had a smaller effect on the global metabolome of E. coli than HPG, which is something to maybe consider in the future when people um, have to choose between one or the other for their specific bomb cat studies. I want to say that in my lab, we these days mainly use HPG, which has um, to do with several reasons, but one of them being that we mainly work with um, sediments that are highly reducing. And in these environments, you cannot use AHA 
because the AZ group would be um, reduced to an amine group. So we basically just have no other choice than using HPG. And the other one was that in our mass spec features, we looked for potential degradation products of AHA and HPG. So we basically identified in the metabolic uh, maps of E. coli, which enzymes would recognize methionine, degrade it to something else. So for example, convert methionine, the amino acid to its keto acid, for example, by just cleaving off the amine group. We followed up and looked whether we can see mass features that match if methionine would be replaced with AHA and HPG and we were unable to see any of those expected M over C features. And what this tells us is that indeed translation seems to be, if not the only thing, then at least the by far main thing for these synthetic amino acids, which is important to know because this is what we want to achieve. We want to um, label newly made proteins and nothing else in the cell with these um, clickable compounds that we can modify using acid alkyl click chemistry. So basically what we have at hand with this is that we have a way of using BonCAD as an activity mark on the protein level. And so the way we are now using this in my lab is to use it as a screen to identify cells that might be uh, become active under certain environmental condition. So I want you to lead you through the idea behind this. <clears throat> Conceptually, this is, I think, very simple. In practice, to do this in the lab, it took quite a while um, to actually pull this off. But so the idea is that if you add a synthetic amino acid, you are able to differentiate between cells that have different levels of activity um, in a particular sample. So cells that undergo a small amount of protein synthesis will be less fluorescently labeled later on than a cell that has been very metabolically active. I think that's pretty clear. Um, but the idea is that if we would have a cell that normally is not very active, if we provide the right stimulus, so that stimulus could be, for example, the addition of an energy source or this, uh, the addition of a carbon source, the addition of a metal cofactor that the cell is lacking in its environment, but it's need for the activity of a crucial enzyme. If we provide that stimulus, the cell would become more translationally active than in the absence of that stimulus. So the idea is that you can use this as a way to screen which um, factors, which compounds might alter the activity and could use, you know, could be used to later on, for example, um, you know, tell you more about the physiology of the cell or maybe even lead to an improved cultivation medium to actually bring these organisms into culture, which I think is still very important in this day and age. Everyone should be trying to culture cells, even though there are strong limitations. This is still a very crucial endeavor in microbiology. So the way you can understand this is we're basically using BOMCAT in the same way as traditionally um, we have studied pure cultures. So if you obtain a new pure culture, you typically measure its growth using OD600 if you have a liquid culture and you screen a bunch of different conditions. So for example, at pH2, pH3, pH4, pH5 and so on, we test how well does the organism grow and you then plot this in a curve and it tells you about the overall physiology of the cell. Using BonCAD, we're doing the same thing, just that instead of OD600 as a measure of growth, we use fluorescence as a measure of translational activity. Um, and rather than doing this on a single organism, we do this with an entire microbial community. And all we have to achieve, quote unquote, is to distinguish the individual activity rate of each individual species or group of organism in a particular sample. So this will be the tricky part that we have worked on in the past um, two, two and a half years or something like that, which was really a group effort. Um, most importantly, by these three people in my lab, um, Nick Reichardt, um, whose study is the main one I want to highlight today, it's currently in review, um, who developed an approach to use this on um, sediment dwelling hot spring microorganisms. My postdoc or former postdoc, um, she finished up in the lab about three months ago, um, Dr. Rachel Spitz, who has been using this um, on uncultured microbes in salt marsh sediments, as well as my postdoc, Dr. Viola Krukenberg, who has been using this approach to study the physiology of yet uncultured Archean bacteria from hydrothermal sediments from the deep sea basin uh, in Guamas in uh, the Gulf of California. So let me first introduce you to the principle, then lead you through the technology part, and then talk a little bit about the organisms we have been studying specifically with this approach. 
So the, one of the first experiments that uh, Nick did to do this is to actually see whether we can actually do this on a pure culture level, whether we can use BombCat for that before we apply this to an environmental system. So this was more a sanity check. We kind of knew this would work, but it's still important to show this. So we basically what you see here is a plot. I apologize that this um, is a little small font um, in which on the x-axis, we have the different conditions under which uh, triplicate cultures of E. coli were grown. And on the y-axis, you have the relative fluorescence intensity of the cells in those cultures after click staining. So after the cells have been grown and stained using acid alkaline click chemistry. If we don't add HPG to the medium, um, you indeed do not get a fluorescent staining, which is consistent with the idea that you know, click chemistry is a very specific approach. In the absence of HPG, the cells will not be stained. If we only add HPG, but no energy or carbon source, you get a small amount of fluorescence, indicating there's a little, what we call baseline activity of the cells. You know, the cells still have energy from when they were grown in the previous medium. And some of that is used to make new proteins. So, um, you know, to let the cells survive basically to hang out for better conditions. Once we add glucose, which is the prime carbon and energy source, of course, for E. coli, we stimulate the activity by about 12 fold, which is consistent with the idea that you can actually indeed use um, a potential substrate to screen for the activity on a single cell level. In turn, if we add a carbon and energy source that E. coli cannot access, sucrose in this particular example, you do not deviate from this baseline activity. So there's no additional energy available. The cells just have the same level of activity as they always do. And interestingly, if we use sorbitol, um, you indeed, that E. coli can also access, but um, it, sorbitol only uh, yields to about 70 to 75% of the energy than glucose does because you need to spend an additional ATP to activate sorbitol to feed it into glycolysis. And you actually see this energy difference that the cells get out of this um, on, a, on, on a single cell level. So this showed to us we can indeed do this and we can actually do a substrate screen on an individual cell level and now we need to take it into the environment. And so for this benchmark study, um, we chose a hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. Um, it's called the Five Sisters Hot Spring number five. It's a cluster of five hot springs. We worked with the fifth one that had um, at the sampling site um, a temperature of about 72 degrees Celsius. So you're just above the uh, photosynthetic limit of life as indicated by the gray color. There's no photosynthetic pigments anymore. Um, and the pH of 8.45. In this particular sample, um, it was dominated by um, members of yet uncultured um, archaeal and bacterial phyla. Most importantly, the Icarchiota, Favidi bacteria, members, um, uncultured members of the Thaumarchiota and the Amatimonaditis, as well as a already cultured phylum, Dinococcus dermos. I do not want to talk too much about um, these particular groups. I just want to highlight one of them namely Ica Kyoto, which were the dominant member of these communities to show you how we approach this idea of testing um, metabolic predictions from genomes. So this is true for many of the other organisms. I just want to highlight one as an example, and this is the Ica Kyoto. So Ica Kyoto are understood to be an obligate thermophilic phylum. At least they have not yet been found in high numbers in non-hydrothermal um, settings. And this has been really developed in the past decade or so by the fantastic work by Jeremy Dutzworth um, and Brian Hedlund, um, who showed that Ica Kyoto are important component and very abundant component in different terrestrial hot springs all across the world. The problem with them is they are yet not available in culture. And when we started this, um, uh, this project, and I think this is still true today, there is yet no experimental data on the physiology or activity. Everything is just genomic predictions. So what we know from the great work from Brian and Jeremy, as well as uh, Seishuang Hua, I hope I pronounced this name correctly, um, a major communications paper from two years ago, and Christian Rinke's uh, microbial dark matter project, is that these Ica Kyoto in different settings across the globe seem to have a very versatile metabolism. They're capable of using many different carbon and energy sources. And interestingly, they have the capacity for both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And some of them in the most recent study by Hua et al, they were shown that some of these 
uh, might actually be able to degrade cellulose and cellobios, which makes them interesting from a biofuel or biotechnological standpoint. Unfortunately, none of this genomic prediction has ever been put to an experimental test. So this was one of the goals of our study to provide first experimental data on that. We were not able to do this for all of them. We were, you know, um, but some of them we could actually experimentally test. And so basically what we did is we did the same as I just showed you for E. coli. We basically took sediment slurry, homogenized it, brought it back into the lab and then incubated it for 48 hours in the presence of HPG. Of course, we ran a control without HPG. And then under specific substrate amendments or changes in the overall physical chemical conditions. So we tested a bunch of carbon sources and energy sources, different concentrations of nitrogen sources. So ammonia, nitride, and nitrate. We added um, different vitamins to see if this stimulated the activity of cells. And we grew the cells under both aerobic, microaerobic, or anaerobic conditions. So we basically just simply changed the headspace composition um, oxygen content. The way we approach this is that we incubated the cells for 48 hours under these conditions, and we then extracted the cells. And the idea is that in each of these 23 different conditions, all of which were done in triplicate, um, different cells would be active or inactive, depending on whether they prefer to be grown in the presence of whatever the substrate um, addition or the physical chemical condition is. We then stain the cells using acid alkane click chemistry. This is a picture of how this looks like. We then feed it into a fluorescence activated cell sorter that my lab uh, could acquire due to the generous support of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, sort 250,000 cells whenever possible into a single tube. So we pull sort them into a single tube and then crack them open using repeated freeze thaw cycles, amplify the 16S RNA genes, Amplicon. Uh, barcode them and then sequence them using uh, Illumina sequencing and feed them into a CHIME2 data tool pipeline. And then later we learn whether the presence of certain cells in the active or inactive populations, you know, what this tells us about the overall activity levels of these cells. So just want to show you an example of how this actually looks like at the cell sorter. It is tricky because these are, you know, environmental samples from sediments. Um, so there's a lot of background noise on the cell sorter, as I'm sure people who have used <laughs> fluorescence uh, activated cell sorting and microbial ecology can talk about a lot more than we do, who only do this since recently. Um, but so here's a plot how this looks like. Our control here, this is the fluorescence event. So fluorescence, bomb cat fluorescence on the y-axis. The x-axis is the forward scatter, which is basically a proxy for the cell size. And we see that in our controlled, which we did not add HPG, um, the gate that we drew to sort the labeled cells basically has a very, very small number of events. Only one out of 10,000 events would be considered positive. So in our HPG only sample to which we didn't add a substrate amendment, but we added HPG, we see that the large population of cells now becomes um, active, which is consistent with the idea that we label um, translationally active cells. I want to point out that in this particular study, we draw the gates very conservatively, as you see here. And this was for two reasons. The first one is there was a lot of variation between the individual samples. Keep in mind, we have 23 different conditions in triplicate um, plus the control. So there was a lot of different conditions. Not all of them looked as nicely as this one. And in addition, we you know, live by the model. It is better to have uh, you know, a few false negative than a single false positive, because any false positives would really um, be detrimental to a whole approach where we want to actually see whether cells get stimulated due to our substrate amendments. So we want to err on the side of better to underestimate than to overestimate the activity of cells. So this is how we did this. If people have any comments on that, I would be very happy to discuss this. This is just how we did this for this particular benchmark study. Um, so I do not have the time to go over all the results. I just want to highlight some of the most important results. And so one of them was that um, it turned out that the in situ activity of the cells, so the activity of cells as shown in the HPG only sample without a substrate amendment was very high. And this was a problem actually for our particular study, unfortunately, because from all the taxa that were present, all the taxa that were at least 1% relative abundance in the sample, at least some of them were active in the HPG only sample. So what this tells us is, you know, the cells were really happy under the 
particular environmental conditions they were growing in in the first place without any substrate amendments. But that made you know, the studying the change that individual substrate additions made to the activity levels very hard to determine just because the original level of activity was already very high. So for any future experiments, we would probably set up the experiment a little bit differently to try to lower the activity level um, of cells to begin with because any substrate stimulation would then lead to a higher difference in relative activity between our control samples and our actual samples. The other one was that the addition of HPG as compared to a no HPG control did not change um, the overall microbial community composition, which is important to know because this shows that the addition of synthetic amino acids didn't impact the microbial activity or microbial growth during a 48 hours of incubations. Because of these two factors, um, when we analyze the microbial community composition and the diversity after um, also of the, um, of the entire sorted cells in gray here and the active cells, so the sorted fraction, we saw that from the 23 different conditions we tested, only two incubation conditions, which are marked in blue here, um, only two of them actually had um, a change in genome diversity index that was statistically significant across all three triplicates, also all three replicates. And this was the addition of cellobios in the the change from aerobic to anaerobic conditions. So that being said, we had multiple um, examples where we actually saw changes in you know, two of the replicates, but not in the third one. We want to be very conservative here and we only take statistical significance across all three triplicates for a given and we go forward with that. I think this is an important highlight of why these studies as well as all studies in biology must be done at least in biological triplicate because there's so much intrinsic biological variation which is a little bit unfortunate, but you know, um, and it might change from experiment to experiment. In our experiment, the biological variation was quite pronounced. So let's take a closer look into these two conditions that actually led to a substantial significant change um, in channel diversity index. So cellulose addition and anaerobic uh, conditions in the headspace. So what you see in these plots here is the different colors indicate the different um, OTUs or technically ASVs that we have identified using our data two pipeline. Um, and this is a log twofold change. So similar as typically, you know, transcription levels are expressed. Um, so a change in activity and we normalize this to the HPG only control. So the activity level with the substrate amendment as compared to without the substrate amendment. If the bar is below the zero line here, it means the cells are less active in the presence of whatever your substrate is, so cellulose or anaerobic conditions. If the bar goes to the top, it shows more activity. So a stimulation of activity due to the changing conditions. So let's go a few, through a few of the highlights here that we learned from this. So the first one that was a little bit surprising to us was that um, if we provide cellubios for VD bacteria, which are highlighted in yellow here, are actually less active um, than under conditions without um, the substrate. I say this is surprising because a recent study um, by Tanya Wojcik's group, specifically Devin Dowd, a great paper that was uh, published, if I remember correctly, in, is in the ISMI journal, um, showed that um, certain other hot spring for VD bacteria from a different site, not from our site, a site in Nevada, if I remember correctly, were actually capable of directly um, degrading cellulose and cellulose. And they did this in a similar substrate analog probing approach the only difference was they used um, fluorescently labeled cellulose particles actually, rather than an indirect approach than we did. Um, members of the Taumachiota um, that we couldn't resolve down to um, a species or genus level. So we just know that they are you know, highly related to um, aerobic ammonia oxidizing Taumachiota were interestingly less active under anaerobic conditions. This is interesting because the closest cultured relatives Keep in mind, you know, we are limited by the cultivation bias here, of course, what we can say about these organisms um, are obligate aerobes. So this is interesting, either suggesting that these organisms were not capable of, um, you know, surviving or competing with other organisms under these conditions, or that this damahiota might actually encode different uh, physiologies than the ones known from culture. 
we also were able to provide first experimental evidence for um, in situ activity of um, a candidate phylum GAL15, which before has only been known by uh, massive parallel gene sequencing studies. So this is the first time that they actually were shown to be active um, physiologically in any environmental system, as far as we can tell. Interestingly, we could provide evidence also for this idea that I discussed before, that members of the ICA Kyoto um, are indeed active under aerobic and anaerobic conditions. So what you see here is that ICA Kyoto are not in this plot. They did not change in their relative activity between anaerobic conditions versus our comparison to aerobic conditions, indicating that they are active under both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. So there's different um, you know, interpretations for that. One could just be they just hang out under anaerobic or anaerobic conditions um, and they just you know, don't have a lot of um, activity change during of 48 hours of incubation. However, it, you know, if, if, if we you know, go back to this idea that we gained from uh, metagenomes, it could indeed be that indeed they are capable of seamlessly switching between their um, lifestyles from aerobic to anaerobic depending on the environmental conditions. Um, so future studies will have to follow up on that, specifically targeting this ICA Kyoto to see if this is actually the case. Now we provide for the first time evidence for the NC2 activity under any environmental conditions, which I think is really cool. So the next step now is that we go beyond the mere identification of cells based on 16S RNA gene sequencing. Um, and so for this, we teamed up um, with the folks at the JGI, our friends and colleagues, Tanya Wojke and Rex Malmström. Um, we wrote a FICUS proposal that was funded um, one and a half, yeah, I think two years ago in which we take some of the cells that we have um, identified to be active under specific substrate addition conditions in this study. Um, and we not only sequence the 16S rRNA using you know, 16S directed PCR, but they actually sequence the whole genome. And with this, we will be able to then map back the genotype of these organisms and directly link it to the in situ phenotype they expressed. So whether they are active or inactive in the presence of a particular substrate. In addition, my grad student Nick Reichert was awarded a DOE Office of Science Graduate Student Research Award last year for his uh, proposal on following up a similar approach to this, but studying specifically uncultured hot spring organisms in another hot spring called the Buffalo Pool in Yellowstone National Park um, that he studied for potential for cellulose degradation. Um, so he's spending this entire year of 2020 in the group of Tanya Boyke. Um, to follow up on these experiments, do a lot of bioinformatic analysis to you know, provide for the first time direct links between the in situ phenotype of potential cellulose degraders and their genotype. And hopefully this can lead to the identification of new organisms that might be important for the biotechnology industry, or maybe ideally even specific enzymes that might be better suited for um, you know, cellulose degradation. In a separate project, um, that uh, I run with uh, my friend and colleague, Brett Baker and Andreas Teske. Um, my postdoc, Dr. Viola Krutenberg, is analyzing the ecophysiology of uncultured archaean bacteria involved in methanogenesis, as well as high molecular weight organic carbon cycling in hydrothermal sediments of the deep sea Guaymas basin, following the same approach to link the genotype with the in situ phenotype. Um, and this is a project that is funded by the National Science Foundation. One other way, um, or one other thing that I want to talk about is, so far I've basically talked about how can we provide links between the taxonomy and the in situ activity, or actually the genotype and the phenotype of cells, but doing this on a still kind of bulk level. So the individual cells, if, excuse me, the, the analysis are still done on an individual cell level, but the sample is still a bulk slurry of sediment of you know 100 milliliter, milliliter or so of sediment slurry. Um, so I was lucky enough to um, convince the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation to try to go to beyond that and bring actually spatial resolution into this. Um, in a study that um, I'm conducting together with uh, Pete Gerges and his postdoc Jeff Marlow at Harvard, my postdoc uh, Rachel Spitz, as well as the uh, group of NICMER um, that is led by Mark Ellisman at UCSD. And so the idea behind this is that we want to understand microbial activity in sediment cores from ideally nanometer up to centimeter scale. So this is something that has not been achieved for any environmental system. Um, and we are not at the nanometer level yet. We are at the sub-micrometer level. 
Um, but hopefully within the next couple of months with the help of Mark Ellisman, we will actually go down to nanometer level. Um, I don't have the time to talk about all the details of this study, the results of which are just being written up for two manuscripts by Jeff and Rachel, but I want to guide you through the idea behind this project and how substrate analog probing can inform us about microbial activity on a small spatial scale. Um, so together we went to Sipawisit Salt Marsh, um, so um, you know, a prevalent site for microbial ecology research for over 50 years, um, a little bit uh, northwest of uh, Woods Hole in Massachusetts, and we took sediment cores, intact sediment cores about 10 centimeters or so deep into the sediment of some of these um, uh, in, in the salt marsh of these tidal ponds there. We brought them back into the lab. Um, Julie Huber was uh, nice enough to offer access to uh, her lab so that we can do this directly in Woods Hole. Um, and we, in an anaerobic chamber, then we place the water, um, the salt marsh water with sterile filtered water from the same site to which we simply added HPG at 50 micromolar concentration. And to some um, of these cores, we also added an additional carbon source because we wanted to see whether substrate amendment uh, changed the activity levels of cells. Specifically, those two carbon sources were intact Spartina grass. So Spartina sea grass that was simply applied on the top of the sediment to let the high molecular weight carbon during the degradation of the Spartina grass uh, percolate through the column. And on the other hand, uh, diesel fuel as a simulant of anthropogenic influence. We then put them back in C2 using gas permeable but liquid impermeable membranes to seal the sediment cores and incubated them for um, a few days up to I think three weeks if I remember correctly. Maybe it was four weeks, but I think it was three weeks. Um, and then we went back and retrieved them and then we did two things. On the one hand, we followed the same protocol as I showed you before. So we extracted the cells, but this time um, in one centimeter increments along the sediment core, identified the cells that were active, the ones that were inactive to then get a spatially resolved activity response of the different microbes um, that are present in the sediment cores. And we did this 1 million cells at a time for each sediment horizon in triplicates. In addition, parallel cores were embedded in electron microscopy grade resin sectioned with a diamond saw and analyzed using electron microscopy combined with energy dispersive um, X-ray spectroscopy. And so with this, we get the mineralogical information um, of the sediment cores in, you know, give or take one centimeter increments. And we were able then to combine this with fluorescence microscopy to try to see whether there are certain trends of, you know, certain minerals influencing the activity of cells around them. So I want to highlight just a few um, results of this and how, how, how this study was done. So here's an example of one of these sections that we did here that Jeff analyzed using um, a combination of fluorescence microscopy. In green here, you see DNA cyber green stained cells around the, the sediment grains in this sample, <coughs> while the red are fluorescently labeled translationally active cells that were attached to those sediment grains. The electron microscopy image from the same section in the EDX elemental maps, um, you know, showing you the presence of calcium, sodium, and so on in this particular field of view. We combined this information with X-ray diffraction analysis that then gave us the information on the mineralogy of these individual sections with which we were then able to map not only the presence of cells in their activity levels, but also identify the specific um, uh, mineral species that were present in those different fields of view. And we then ran um, sophisticated um, um, image analysis in MATLAB and in R, where we basically mapped the fluorescence confocal microscopy images onto the SEM, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy um, images, to then study the distribution of active versus inactive cells around these um, mineral grains. So Jeff is currently writing this up. So I want to just highlight um, a few, you know, nuggets of this basically to give an idea or, you know, maybe uh, inform future experiments um, in case you're interested in this kind of approach. So one thing we can do, for example, is, so this is a particular field of view in which the different um, minerals are color coded, the purple or, yeah, 
purple or pink color is quartz, for example, and so on. And then we basically bin the presence of individual cells, either inactive here in yellow and blue, um, the active ones, around a certain distance of these uh, uh, mineral particles or sediment grains. And we do this in uh, batches of five micrometers. So what this means, for example, between zero and five micrometer, about 30% of all the inactive cells are within a distance of five micrometer away from any minerals in this particular field of view. And about 15% of those cells are active. Because with mineralogical information, we then can identify whether these trends of biomass around sediment mineral particles in their respective activity levels actually change due to the mineralogy. So this is something, uh, this analysis is still ongoing, but um, so this is a kind of a new way of how we can actually approach the in situ positioning of the cells and their respective activity levels within micrometer spheres around uh, intact sediment particles under as close as possible in situ conditions. I understand it's not truly in situ because we brought them back into the lab and then brought them back into the environment. This is the best you can do in order to you know, learn about the activity levels about these cells. In addition, as we said, we then sort the active and inactive fractions from these sediment cores in one centimeter increments. And with this, we will then eventually be able to tell um, the activity levels of different organisms, different lineages of organisms in these samples and whether under certain conditions, so addition of Spartina seagrass, for example, in diesel fuel, change the respective activity levels across the sediment horizons. So down to about 10 centimeters. Some of the cores were six centimeters, so six to 10 centimeters in total. So in this, for example, we can see that of all the cells in the top horizon, about um, you know, 15 or so percent of all cells as identified by 16SR and a gene sequencing were members of the desulfobacteriales, so sulfur reducing bacteria. But this group of organisms represented 25% of all the active cells. So indicating that the presence of the organisms alone is a bad indicator um, for the activity levels of these organisms. And all of this has gone through um, um, the Bonkett facts approach that I just told you before. So with this, I hope I can show you that not only we are able to identify the organisms, link back taxonomy to phenotype, genotype to phenotype, but also do this under highly resolved, uh, in, in a highly resolved manner in both 2D and 3D space in intact sediment cores. So actually really complex um, environmental systems. And I think this is very promising for any future studies for people who want to expand on trying to use this kind of next generation physiology approaches to um, actually less challenging samples. I'm pretty sure that sediment samples are among the most complicated um, ones to pull this off. Probably soil is even worse. Uh, I don't want to start doing this with soil. So anyone who is working with soil has my highest admiration. But you know, if we can do this with sediment cores, I'm sure people can do this with human microbiome samples. So this might really be a game changer of how we approach um, you know, activity levels of cells under in vivo or close to in vivo, close to in situ conditions. So to sum up, I hope I could show you that these next generation physiology approaches, which we define as non-destructive approaches that provide insights into the in situ physiology of cells uh, could really be a game changer once broadly applied to many environmental systems. I believe the most prominent or most promising, not prominent, the most promising um, approaches um, because they are the most flexible ones are substrate analog probing an example of which I told you about today, Bonkett. There's many other approaches. If you're interested, I recommend, um, you know, read up um, our review paper. We would be very happy to discuss with you um, any ideas you have. And the other one is uh, the combination of stable isotope probing, specifically deuterated water isotope probing with Raman microspectroscopy. So this is an approach that's been pioneered by Wei Huang, David Berry, uh, Roman Stocker, Michi Wagner in the last uh, few years. Um, and that we are currently also um, trying to get going here at Montana State um, after I brought a Raman micro spectrophotometer to campus. So we're really excited to do this as well here soon. Um, I showed you specifically how non-canonical substrate analog probing using clickable amino acid analogs can provide insights into the activity levels of cells 
and how we can use these approaches to test hypotheses on the metabolism and the in-situ activity levels of hot spring and other sediment microbes. And one of the most promising trajectories, I believe, for the future is to combine not only BONCAT, but other next generation physiology approaches with other visualization techniques. So for example, Raman microspectroscopy, zero block phase electron microscopy, uh, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, and so on, that really together can provide us a new view into the world of microorganisms. Before I finish up, um, I want to highlight that my lab is doing many other things than just next generation physiology. Um, Specifically, we're working on revealing the ecophysiology of uncultured archaea in hot spring sediments and deep sea sediments. We're working on identifying novel sources and sinks of methane in the environment. And we also have a project on uncultured multicellular bacteria. So if you're interested in any of these um, um, research projects, or if you just want to learn out more, um, I encourage you to visit our lab website, environmental-microbiology.com. Uh, to learn more about uh, you know, projects of people in my lab. With that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I think I already highlighted the contributions of all the people who did the actual work, but most importantly, I want to again highlight the great work of uh, Nick Reichardt, Rachel Spitz, Jeff Marlow, uh, Viola Krugenberg, and other folks in my lab. Uh, thanks a lot to our collaborators at MSU, at Harvard, and at JGI. And most importantly, also the people actually pay for uh, us doing all of this. And most importantly, I'm very grateful for uh, the support by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, pretty much nothing I've presented to you today would have been possible without their support. And I'm deeply indebted to them um, to supporting my, my young lab. Um, NASA is funding our uh, research into the ecophysiology of hot spring microbes, NSF is supporting both our work in hot springs as well as in the deep sea Guaymas basin. Um, FICUS provides us with um, technological and instrumental support at JGI and EMSL. Um, and we thank also the National Park Service for allowing us access to some of the most gorgeous uh, places on earth in Yellowstone National Park to do our actual research. Um, and with that, um, I'm happy to take um, any questions if you have any, and I thank you again for your attention. Thank you, Roland. That's fantastic. Um, we have actually quite a few questions that have come through over um, over YouTube. Um, I saw us hit uh, 122 concurrent views at one point in time, so I know that we're uh, uh, we're reaching quite a few people. Um, the first question uh, comes from from Luke McKay. Um, he was asking, are the newly made proteins with HBG as functional as the old proteins with, with regular methionine? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an awesome question. Um, unfortunately, there's no experimental data on that yet, um, at least on the activity levels. I know that Victoria Orphans Group has been working on heterologously expressing um, some proteins. I think it was actually MCR that tried um, to do it, but I think also other proteins. But so far, as far as, far as I know, there's no results from that yet. So to see if the activity levels of the enzyme change. That being said, there is a paper that looked into the structural changes due to exposure to biothogonal amino acid that is published. And the results um, that were done with both X-ray crystallography and NMR showed that there's basically no change to that particular protein from E. coli um, if grown in the presence of, I believe it was AHA, so the A site containing um, uh, amino acid homolog. Great. Okay, there was quite a bit of discussion uh, in the comments here about um, about this next question, but maybe we can we can start with the first part of it, and you can sure. and you can add to it. Uh, the the uh, somebody who I can't identify said that HPG is better for reduced um, anoxic sediments, and mm -hmm. why is that? And maybe could you provide any um, sure. um, information sure. about that? Uh, it's actually pretty simple. So that it boils down to um, let me just share my screen again. Okay, do you see my screen again? Yes. Okay. Um, so the, it boils down to the fact what is used as the functional reporter group in AHA and HPG. Um, so HPG, um, as you see here, has an alkyne group that is you know, chemically completely stable under pretty much any condition. It's simply a carbon-carbon triple bond. AHA 
um, which is the other one that historically we started using when I was still with Victoria, um, has an AZ group. And the problem is under highly reducing and alkaline conditions, the AZ group is reduced to, a, to, a, uh, to an amine. And then it's not clickable anymore. So it's still there. It is you know, stable in the sense that the protein is stable, but you cannot detect the incorporated synthetic compound in the protein anymore. If you want to look up specifically what those conditions are, um, we have actually done uh, NMR experiments on that in my original bond cat paper from 2014 that was published in Environmental Microbiology. Great. Okay, um, other questions. Uh, can you do this in eukaryotes? Yes. Um, actually, the original bond cut approach was first developed in uh, eukaryotes. Um, people have done this with uh, human cancer cell lines, with brain cells from uh, mice, uh, intact tissue, muscle cells, everything. So pretty much everything. Um, as far as I can tell, at least what is available in the literature and for people that I know who are doing this, I'm not aware of a single pure culture that, that was not able to be labeled yet. You know, considering that there's a, you know, a, a, a reporting bias and so on. But um, as we've discussed in our recent review paper, there's at least 40 cultured and uncultured heal phyla where this was tested on successfully. Um, Elipasulka's lab has shown that you can do this with um, both bacteriophages and eukaryotic viruses. Um, and it can be done on, you know, on intact mice. Excellent, okay. Um... Roland, when you're done with this, you're going to have to go look at all the comments from, from this. Uh, um, the live chat's got some fantastic uh, accolades for you. A lot of people really appreciative. Um, the, the chat on YouTube on Twitter? No, this is on you. Uh, this is on the YouTube chat, actually. Um, okay, we have a question from Will Leavitt. Um, he, he wanted to know what is the core energy metabolism of the IG archaeota? The core energy metabolism of the icarchiota, meaning um, which particular carbon and energy sources they can use. Um, I think they encode the potential for using a lot of different carbon and energy sources. And there is examples of metagenome assembled genomes, of course, right, that just use molecular oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor or use uh, nitrate as a terminal electron acceptor. That's the, the, the most prevalent ones, as far as I know, from metagenome assembled genomes how many max there are and how many of those actually encode exactly this, I'm not entirely sure, but we are talking about probably a dozen max or something like that, maybe, maybe two dozen. So there's not a lot of information available, I think, as far as I know, at least. I think the person to ask who knows a lot more about Ekagyota than me is Brian Hedlund and Jeremy Dotsworth. Cool. Okay. Well, I think that about covers it for now. Um, oh, uh, one more, one more. Uh, oh, I guess this is a follow-up is about the carbon and electron acceptors, but um, yeah, that can be, I guess we can, we can, we can redirect him towards uh, Brian Hedlund. Oh yeah. Uh, I can okay. also go online and uh, talk more on YouTube if people have questions, so. Great. Okay, well, I think I'm going to, I'm going to close this down since we're just a couple minutes before um, uh, 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 the time is up and we do have a little bit of a lag here. So by the time this actually hits everybody, we're going to be basically out of time. If you have other questions for Roland, please find him at uh, the website that he mentioned there. He's at um, uh, uh, Environ Micro Bio on Twitter. And uh, obviously you can find his email if you're in industrious. Um, Roland, thank you so much. I think a lot of people really, really enjoyed this talk and uh, we really appreciate you, your contribution. Sounds great. Thanks a lot for hosting, Cam. Looking My forward pleasure. to the next one next week, right? Yes, there will be, there will be many more micro seminars coming up. We've got quite a few signups. So again, you can, uh, you can sign up through uh, ISME or our site, uh, Microbiology Seminar at, web, uh, at Word, uh, wordpress.com. Um, we're a micro seminar if you search for us on Google. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Cameron.